hills are falling, crumbled and spires in every land, bells still are chiming and calling, calling. ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. 
As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
graciously hear the prayers of your people, that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Deuteronomy, chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I commanded you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice and holding fast to Him. For He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come in to his courts. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, 
will be liable to the fire of hell. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jer Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, let you, what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When it comes to the commandments of God, Satan doesn't always want you to ignore them altogether. Very often, he's happy to have you stare at the outer shell of those commandments of stone. In fact, the devil's quite happy for you to stare deeply at a rather polished exterior of those commandments. And he wants you to do so, so that you will see your own face shining back at you and rejoice at your own obedience. Jesus, however, wants no such thing. Jesus wants you to look beneath the outer shell of those commandments and see the inside of them. He wants you to see the jagged shards of stone, the pieces of God's word and command that you shattered and that tore you to pieces. Jesus wants you to see and feel how these shards of the commandments have pierced you and buried you. And he wants you to see this so that you'll cry out for his mercy and rejoice when he comes to your aid. Last week's gospel text ended with some rather interesting words, words that are pretty essential to understanding our gospel text for today. Last week we heard Jesus say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So with these words, Jesus is addressing the real problem that the Pharisees have. The problem of the Pharisees is not that they take God's law too seriously. It's not that they are overly obsessed with the commandments and living righteously according to them. No one could possibly be over-obsessed with serving God in obedience. Rather, the problem with the Pharisees was that they loved to polish the exterior of the commandments while not keeping them inwardly. They love to, in fact, add to God's command and use that as a kind of their own invented commandments as a kind of buffer to shine the exterior of the commandments so they could see how holy they were by comparison to all of the sinners who were breaking those commandments. They were far more righteous. They were pleasing to God. And so in all of this, they failed to perceive how they had shattered those commandments into a million pieces from within through all of the ways in which they had hated and condemned and judged their brothers and sisters. And so, when it comes to the words of our gospel text for today, Jesus is adding on to these words about the Pharisees and wants us to see things clearly. Your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes if you wish to inherit eternal life, means you must keep the commandments both outwardly and inwardly. So here Jesus brings up two examples of the fifth and sixth commandments. Have you refrained from stabbing anyone to death in your life? Well done, but that doesn't mean you've kept the commandment. In fact, if you have burned an anger against people, if you've insulted your brother and spoken poorly of him, then you are just as guilty of murder as those who have plunged the knives into the flesh of the innocent. You are entirely unworthy of God's love because of this. In the same way, have you refrained from physically giving your body to someone other than your spouse? Congratulations. But you haven't actually kept this commandment if you have so much looked with lust upon someone else. You are not righteous. You are not holy. You are entirely condemned. So in both of these cases, the outer shell of the commandment may still be uncracked and shiny. But Jesus is telling us that what's inside is what counts. And indeed, inside, you have pierced yourself with unrighteousness. You have buried yourself under a million shards of jagged, broken commandments. And Jesus wants you to know this. Because if you don't, you won't cry out for his mercy. You either won't cry out for it because you don't think you need it, or you won't cry out for it because you don't think you could possibly get it. 
When I was in college and seminary, I spent a lot of time waiting tables. Uh, I personally never worked on the Sunday afternoon shifts. I always made sure to request that off so I could go to church. But amongst those who did, there's a very common tale you'll hear from people who have waited tables, which is that the absolute worst shift of the week to work is the Sunday afternoon shift, and in particular at the beginning of it, right when all of the big tables come in from the church services they've just attended. You'll oftentimes find the most rude and insulting people in this group. You'll get people who tip very poorly. Sometimes they won't even give you a tip. They'll give you one of those little tracks that looks like a hundred dollar bill, and then you open it up and it tells you how you're going to hell. This is, I got one of those when I was waiting tables at, the, uh, at a restaurant near the seminary in Fort Wayne. Not exactly a good look for folks. But in particular, a very odd thing that would happen was that these people would come in and order food from you, uh, and then they would lecture you about how it is that you should be going to church on Sunday morning, which is really, really quite odd. It'd be like if you bought illegal street drugs from someone, and then you turned around and looked at them and said, you know, you shouldn't be selling this poison to people. All right, well, you probably shouldn't be buying it. It's a bit strange. But of course, it reveals what's going on here that Jesus is speaking about. Here were people who outwardly kept the commandment. They gathered to hear God's word. But of course, you haven't really kept God's word if your desire right after hearing it is to go make a waitress at Chili's cry for not being holy enough. You have failed to keep God's commandment, but in your self-righteousness, because these other people haven't kept the outward shell, you convince yourself that you are holy and righteous by comparison, and all you see is your own holy face shining back upon you, and you don't see your need for forgiveness. You don't see that you are just as condemned and in need of salvation as those who haven't outwardly kept the commandment. It's a strange thing that people do in so many ways. We look out upon a world filled with violence and crime, and we, a bunch of people who have murdered more than we could possibly count with our anger and our hatred and our gossip, we look at those who actually pierce knives or bullets into people, and we condemn them and despise them and pat ourselves on the back for being so much more righteous by comparison. It's why we look at those who have physically committed adultery, and this is one of the few sins left in the world that we still feel like we're comfortable lashing out at people publicly about this. One of the last sexual sins where we feel like there's still a, lot of amount of, a great amount of social pressure to condemn those who have stepped out on their spouses. We, the same people who give ourselves over to lust endlessly, who make billion-dollar industries out of pornography and licentiousness. So in all of this, we see the bright, shining face of our own righteousness shining back at us. And we're doing the devil's will. We're staring at our own reflection, at the polished exterior of the commandments, and there's no room left in our eyes to look at Christ. There we are, filled with unbelief, because we're filled with pride. But, of course, the devil is also happy to corrupt us with unbelief in the form of despair. And this is the other reason that the devil wants you staring at that exterior shell of the commandments. Because when you tell yourself that God must love you because you're the kind of person who outwardly keeps the commandments, because you're not the kind of person who would break them, well, what happens when you become the kind of person who outwardly breaks those commandments? I grew up in the suburbs in the 1990s, and the church culture of the suburbs in the 1990s was very centered on gathering as many youth as you could together and teaching them about abstinence. And I'm obviously all in favor of teaching youth abstinence, but when you grew up in the 90s, that was kind of the only thing that you ever heard from church culture. Very much about how it is that you were to be pure before marriage and not a whole lot about Jesus. So I went to school with a lot of people who were involved in churches that would kind of fit that description. And when I was in high school, I began to notice a rather strange phenomenon. The girls who would wear the purity rings or the bracelets who were really big into this, 
would stumble and fall and they would do the thing that they had pledged to themselves and to their God that they wouldn't do before marriage. And then they would just immediately nosedive into promiscuity. It's a bit strange. It would be like if during the Super Bowl today, Patrick Mahomes came out and his first pass was an interception and then he just walked off the field and retired. Just immediately gave up. Why is this? Well, I think the answer is quite simple. They saw the bright, shining face of their own righteousness in the exterior of that commandment. And then when that commandment shattered and fell to pieces, they went from being the people that God loved because they kept the commandment to becoming the people that God couldn't possibly love because they'd failed. And well, if you're torn apart by guilt and condemnation, a strange but very common response that people have is that they just dive further into those sins so they can numb themselves to the pain. I think in a way, it's sort of like we imagine, it's like if you're being pierced by the guilt of sin, it's like a nail, but if you can just lay down on a bed of nails, the surface tension isn't as great and you won't feel that condemnation in the same way. And so we find the same thing in, in so many ways. This is why when we've told ourselves we would never become the people who would get divorced. Well, what happens when we get divorced? We end up becoming the people who just steamroll over four marriages. We, we, we are the people who would never give themselves over to addiction and substance abuse. But then once we become those people, we can't actually bring ourselves to turn away from the substance abuse, from drugs and alcohol because the numbness that they provide seems like a better option than that life of living in the endless stabbing pain of guilt. We would never become the kind of people who would abandon those in times of need, who would abandon our loved ones when they need us the most. And yet, when their needs become so pressing that we just give up and abandon them, we very much become the kind of people who abandon anyone who ever needs anything from us at any point. That is, in various and sundry ways, the kind of key sin, I think, of life in 21st century American suburbia is being an island unto yourself where you're not responsible for anyone. And I do think that so much of this comes from a world where we spent staring at our own righteous reflection and then once that stone exterior came crumbling down, we absolutely could not figure out how to work ourselves out of it. So don't do the will of the devil. Don't stare in the face of the shiny tablets of stone. Look within the commandments. See your sins, your countless failures, and your unfathomable corruption. Feel the massive jagged weight of condemnation that is pressing down upon you. Don't hide from it. Don't try and bury that, that sense of your own burying by looking at other people's transgressions. Endure it. Because when you do, you will see your need for Christ. And when you see your need for Christ, you will hear the voice of the Savior who's coming to your rescue. In Colossians chapter 2, St. Paul writes the following words. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us our, all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is how Paul describes the relationship of the, between Christians and the commandments now in Christ. So that's who your Savior is. That's the victory he's won for you. When you were buried underneath that wretched condemnation of the commandments that you had broken, when they were piercing into your flesh at every point and giving you profound agony. 
there in that moment, Jesus healed every shard of your disobedience with his own obedience. There Jesus Christ, the Son of God, true God and true man, and the only one born of woman to actually keep the law, brought his perfect keeping of the commandments with him to the cross. Commandments that were not just externally kept, but inwardly kept, that were perfect and pure. And there, as, you, as he stood before your God at Calvary, he gave your Father in heaven the absolute perfection you needed in order to inherit eternal life. There at the cross, Jesus Christ made his obedience your obedience. He made his righteousness your righteousness. Every word that God had commanded of mankind, Jesus kept it all. And with his dying words, he declared to his Father in heaven that all of these things were now yours. He wrote your name underneath that perfect keeping of the commandments. And because he did this, Christ was able to, to save you and to rescue you from that mountain of sin, that mountain of jagged, broken commandments. So from that mountain called Calvary, with his hands pierced in place, Jesus reached out to you. And he reached those nail-pierced hands into the mountain of condemnation that had buried you, into that mountain made up of jagged, stabbing condemnation. And with his nail-pierced hands, he lifted you up. He lifted you up out of condemnation, lifted you up out of sorrow, lifted you up out of failure, and lifted you up into the hands of his Father in heaven. Once your flesh was pierced and torn apart by the condemnation you brought from shattering God's commandments, but at the cross... Jesus Christ healed your wounds with his own. He restored your flesh with the piercing of his own flesh. And there, in that victory over sin, he gave you victory over the devil. He placed you into the hands of God, declaring that you were now perfect and pure, worthy to be called a child of God forever. And he also declared that every word the devil spoke to you about his commandments was a lie. You were not righteous by the commandments, but neither are you any longer condemned by the commandments. You have been made righteous by Christ's obedience. So, now, when you look at the commandments, don't do the will of the devil. Don't look for your own bright, shining face in the polished exterior of that commandment. Instead see, those com instead, see those commandments rightly. When you look at them, see the face of Christ shining from them. Christ who perfectly kept them and credited his obedience to you. See the face of the one who kept the commandments perfectly, so that he could pull the shards of disobedience from your own flesh and give you eternal life. When you look at the commandments, see the face of Christ, who knew no anger, who knew no lust, who knew absolutely no sin at all, so that you could know what it means to be eternally healed by the love of God. Now, when you look at the commandments and the one who has kept them, rejoice to know this beautiful and wonderful truth, that the Lord your God no longer condemns you. The Lord your God loves you and cherishes you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please rise as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as you have lifted your church up out of condemnation, as you have given us the forgiveness of sins, we pray that you may bless us to rejoice in this gift always. When the devil attacks us, when Satan seeks to convince us that God could po not possibly love those, who have shattered his word, who have become the kind of people who despise his commandments. Bless us to rejoice in the promise that we are no longer the kind of people who despise his commandments. We are those who have perfectly kept them because we are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray that you may bless the work of your church throughout the world that you may grant your church faithful pastors who will proclaim the name of Christ, who will proclaim his salvation to all of those lost in unbelief, those who seek their own righteousness, those seeking their own righteousness in the commandments, through the faithful witness of your church, through the faithful confession of your name. May they know the truth that righteousness is found in Jesus Christ and his mercy alone. Lord, in your mercy. Father, as so many throughout this world are suffering, we pray for all of those who are in need, in agony, in pain, in mourning, especially for those who are suffering from the earthquake that affected Syria and Turkey this past week. For those who are mourning their loved ones who died, we pray that you may bless them to find comfort in the promise of Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God, through who, who through his death and resurrection has conquered death. For those who are wounded and are suffering, May you grant your holy angels to watch over them, to guard them and protect them. May you grant them faithful doctors and nurses to restore them to health. May you bless the international community to come to their aid. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray likewise for all governments throughout the world that you may grant those in positions of authority faithfulness to use it honorably, to faithfully serve all of those entrusted to their care, both young and old, rich and poor, black and white, born and unborn. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those who are sick throughout this world, especially Amy and Barbara, Bo and Carm, Carla, Carm, Casey, Ciara, Donna, Dottie, Duane, Elizabeth, Gracie, and Jack, Joan and John, Juanita, Judy, Lorette, Megan and Nita, Paul, Phyllis, Scott, Rich, Tom, and Troy, and Ariel that God would grant healing, to, that you would grant healing to their bodies and give them strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray that you may also send your holy angels to watch over and protect all of those serving in our nation's armed forces, including Reese. May you bless him and all who serve to carry out their duties faithfully. May you send your angels to guard and protect them, and may you bring their work to a speedy and blessed end. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 
Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is might and give him thanks and praise. It is truly good right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you holy lord almighty father everlasting god through jesus christ our lord for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world you have made known to the nations in your son in him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Body of Christ given unto death for you. Take a drink, the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Now the true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.